we are live, and um, we have Karen Hart from Trump, League of Cities and Towns. Good morning. It is Friday, January 27th, and Senate Economic Development General, Housing and General Affairs. Karen. Thank you very much for um, having us. Uh, we really appreciate the opportunity to, to testify on this bill, and the committee room looks I know I was in here before, but the committee room looks so different on Zoom than it does oh, in real life. Oh, they, have, the, they have angles. It looks like. like Senator, you're like way, way over there. I know. That's <laughs> what <laughs> what <laughs> in my committee, I show each a food bowl in front of me. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes, you do look like you're in Florida or something with all that food. Well, I know. Senator Chittenden is keeping us well fed. I mean, you just all have to eat it. So we are really grateful for the opportunity to talk about this issue. Clearly, housing is, a, is essentially a crisis in every town in the state. You heard some really compelling stories yesterday morning I was watching um, yeah. about people's efforts to, to find housing. And we've heard those same stories. We've heard about people um, turning down jobs and going back um, to wherever they thought they were moving from um, because they couldn't find housing. There was a, um, there was a, a individual who was um, taking a job in the town of Windsor last year who actually had to um, just decline in the end and, and because he couldn't find housing. Um, we do think we need to take a holistic approach to the, to the housing effort. Um, we know we need to amend zoning to reduce barriers to housing development. We also need to address party status and permitting and address substantial impediments to housing development imposed by Act 250. Permits required by the Agency of Natural Resources and VTRANS and as you've been looking at over the last couple of years, costs of land and labor um, availability and cost of materials, bank lending practices, and more. All of that contributes to the housing crisis um, across the country and in Vermont. And what we are hearing is that the problem is more acute in Vermont than it is in, in other places. Um, I want you to uh, Remember that land use planning and permitting are core responsibilities that the voters in more than 253 cities, towns, and villages have granted to their municipal governments. According to the Agency of Commerce and Community Development, there are 253 municipalities with adopted plans. Um, 242 of those are current plans and confirmed by the Regional Commission. There are 207 municipalities with adopted zoning or subdivision bylaws. I will um, send you my uh, testimony afterwards. Uh, I always find spelling mistakes when I'm reading it. So, <laughs> so sorry, Karen, how, what was that number again? So 207 municipalities have adopted zoning or subdivision bylaws. 253 have adopted plans 242 of those are current plans and confirmed by the regional commissions. So there are a few towns out there that have expired plans that are, where you have to renew them every eight years. So they're working on um, renewals to their. So I suppose we have 247 towns or cities. So we have cities, towns, and villages. Because um, there's so some there villages some, that some have right municipal there, right? plans. Um, so, so there are villages around the right, state God, that actually have separate. <laughs> yeah. yeah, sadly, I don't know. Yeah, there, yeah, it's 247 now. Yeah, um, because of Essex Junction City. Right. So this is a tremendous body of work undertaken by dedicated and volunteer planning commissions, zoning boards of adjustment, and development review boards. Emphasis on volunteer. They're trying to do the right thing for their communities, and they're trying to implement the many requirements in planning and zoning statutes that have accumulated over the years. I'm the vice chair of my planning commission in Moortown. Um, Gwyn Zakoff, who works with me, is the chair of her planning commission in Brookfield, so we sort of live this um, in small communities. The workload's huge, it's complex, 
It's frequently controversial and it's stressful. Um, and as a result, many volunteers at the local level are calling it quits. And we have a real um, crisis yeah. in terms of volunteer local officials. I've been I think accused of killing people's grandmothers when mm -hmm. I was on the Oh, our executive that was when they wanted to put the grain case. union over at the, yeah. There's Hopefully that hasn't happened to you. Always, <laughs> there's always a new it gets twist. Very, <laughs> it gets very, it does. Deep. People say stuff like that about parking issues. So yeah, things get very emotional. <laughs> they <laughs> do, <laughs> they do. So um, I, I, um, I want to move to the actual bill, but I would also recommend that you hear from the Mayor's Coalition on Housing we Issues. We have Mayor Lott coming in next week. Oh, you do? Yes. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. So um, they put together a legislative agenda, which I actually sent to Scott yesterday, I believe. Um, and housing is really front and center for on, on that agenda. And in terms of moving to the bill, um, we are concerned that the first five sections of the draft bill mandate how municipalities permit housing developments, and that will eliminate any kind of discretion at the local level for planning commissions, zoning administrators, and development review boards. I understand that that might actually be the um, full-on intent of the legislation, but municipalities are not one size fits all. And what may be reasonable in one community and necessary, for instance, in the cities where the mayors are, um, are working, is not ne necessarily going to work in, in smaller communities and may result in exacerbated um, problems. And again, I, I want to emphasize that we understand that zoning needs to, needs to change. Um, uh, we did have one suggestion um, that did, oh, and I should also say, we were, um, we were, uh, we had several conversations with Representative Bongarts regarding his bill, mm -hmm. and you and, and Senator Bongarts came into our December BLCT board meeting, um, where I think they were fairly clear that they had some issues with Senator Bonkarts' draft bill. I think um, it was constructive that we heard yeah. really specific feedback and right. the need to focus on other parts of the law that is right. developing. Right. And, I, and I think, Senator, you definitely heard that um, recommendation. I'm, I'm not sure that Senator Bonkarts' bill reflects that um, because it really doesn't address Act 250. Um, so, parking spaces, I did want to just take that as an example. Um, the prohibition on more than one parking space per dwelling unit. And not it, a prohibition, but a restriction. A restriction on requiring it at the town level. A developer could you, add you more could than one. You could justify. Oh, the well, developer I mean, could yes, just about yeah. parking maximums right now, so right, I don't right. want to, right. I don't want to, you know. Right. Risk. Right. Well, exactly to the, to the point. So in, in a smaller, more rural community where there's more space, it might be fine to just have one parking space per, per dwelling unit. In Montpelier, where parking's always been an issue and where Act 250 denied a parking garage um, and where you have to move your cars to clear snow, uh, one parking space per dwelling unit would be really problematic. We hear so, that. That's yeah. a good champion for raising that issue on the committee. <laughs> parking was when I was accused of killing Grant. Oh, there was parking. And <laughs> actually, well, it was putting in a parking lot. And yeah. It, OK. It, uh, yeah, so it, you, it's very close to my heart. Right. We, we understand that. So um, I also need to comment on emergency shelters. And I think what I'm going to say here is going to be wildly unpopular. Okay. Um, <laughs> <The> preface. <laughs> yes. So um, adding emergency shelters to the list of facilities that may only be regulated with respect to um, the limitations section of, of uh, Title 24 will exacerbate an already unmanageable reality at the local level. And I need to explain that a bit. 
um, we, we don't have a good definition of emergency shelter. Um, we're not sure which agencies regulate and manage emergency shelters. Are there staff there to provide support services? Are emergency shelters hotels where people are lodged on a temporary basis? Are they encampments? Uh, the governor's budget calls for $26 million for emergency housing, including general assistance and adverse weather conditions to assure every Vermonter has a place to go for the night. The general assistance and adverse weather conditions is, um, our, our understanding is that's essentially the hotels where people are lodged. Um, at the local level, the hotel program puts local governments in impossible situations where police and emergency medical service calls to hotels have skyrocketed since the COVID pandemic. Do you have December. numbers? Um, I do have numbers. I don't okay. have them written down. I have a few um, municipalities who are very reluctant to have their names attached to these comments because they're definitely not um, PC. Even if it's de-identified, I think numbers yeah. would be helpful. So in one community um, where there are three hotels, um, they, they had about 200 calls to the hotels pre-pandemic mm -hmm. and they had um, but more than 1,300 in the last year. Okay. Um, in in Rutland City, there are eight hotels, and they have uh, statistics um, about uh, the number of calls to those hotels, not only police, but also emergency medical services. Mm -hmm. Because there are no, what we hear is there are no support services around the, the hotels. Right and there's not staff there. I'm not denying that that takes up a lot of our emergency service calls. We, our responsibility is still to look regionally at would those emergency calls come from elsewhere? Yes. Would they be coming from a shop or a bookstore where someone had a, you know, so, episode? I mean, you know, yeah, to, so, um, or a uh, street corner. A, a couple of the cities have make that distinction mm -hmm. okay. um, but I think the the essential message is that you're asking police and emergency medical services 911 calls to to take the place of the support services that are are present in the nonprofits and the Good Samaritans and the cops. I hear you defining yeah. shelter so right. yes, I think mean, that's what I was going to say. Yeah. There is a difference. Good yeah. Samaritan has staff. Right. There's a Maybe stark not. difference in yes. terms of calls. Right. Yeah. Oh, but the yeah. hotels are just hotels. Yeah. They're, yeah. Right. Yeah. They're unsuper Sometimes they, they, during COVID there was, I think, more support, more supervision than I think now we are. That may not. We'll, right. we'll hear. But I think what yeah. I'm hearing you say is you want a definition of a better we definition. Need, we need a definition. Shelter. We mm -hmm. need some ability to um, regulate those kinds of facilities, and they need to be located in places where they're they are proximate to support services mm -hmm. and um, and and those kinds of things. Um, in, in just one more example, we, I'm told that in Berlin, at the Good Samaritan Haven, they've had maybe um, 30 calls over the last year, and they've had more than 400 to the, um, to the hotel that's hosting mm -hmm. people, because there's no other place to turn. That's a helpful distinction. And yeah. the hotel yeah. is across the street yeah. from the hotel. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So we don't disagree, I just doubt it's really helpful. Yeah, we, we will put that that data together. The 300 to 1300 is pretty big data if you can, mm -hmm. I mean, that's, yeah. that's yeah. pretty stark. Hotels yeah. generally, unless somebody has a heart attack, you don't get a lot of hotels. Yeah, well, it's still. a hotel, it's, a, yeah. it's housing. It's I housing. mean, the mm -hmm. state is doing a very good job of providing the housing mm -hmm. and the right. shelter, and that's what, mm -hmm. um, that's what they're, the focus is. Okay. And some of these suggestions might also come with some support if you have ideas for a definition yeah. and all these changes. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Appreciate that. Everybody. Yeah. Um, I, I would just mention the requirements in Section 5 for reporting to the Department of Housing and Community Development. Mm -hmm. We just need to be mindful of the fact that um, not all towns have um, 
access to high speed internet. Well, or um, never let us forget it. We appreciate that. We're working on it. We're working on it. I was going to say that. 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 East Bear Swamp, one of the Bear Swamp roads that oh, way. Interesting, interesting. So you yeah. all got your yeah. Well, the the com communications union districts, I think, are doing an epic job, and they are getting yeah. out there, but it does take time. But it takes um, it takes an amazing amount of time before you can yeah. string. Paper. It also takes a fair bit of um, expertise to file reports to the Agency of Commerce and Community Development. It's not an easy thing to do, having done it. So. Um, but yeah. you were our poster child, because I remember all through COVID, the beginning particularly, when you were driving to your elementary school or wherever you yeah, were driving. It was driving, the elementary so school. Be on your phone to, yeah, to yeah. tune in. Yeah, at recess, which was always fun. <laughs> Look, that no, I, I had a spray. teacher who was <laughs> teaching her class from the more <clears throat> general store. Oh, yeah. She's down yeah. parked in the parking lot at the hot yeah. spot. Yeah. Yeah, that's where yeah. Karen was. Yeah. Um, let's see, uh, we, we do appreciate your proposing um, granting discretion to a town to allow the zoning administrator to approve minor subdivisions. That's been an um, issue in, in a number of towns because if you have a subdivision, um, advice of um, some, some attorneys will say that you already have that authority to determine what's a minor subdivision and allow the zoning administrator to make those decisions, which are then appealed to the Development Review Board. But um, some attorneys say that that discretion is not allowed in the statute. So making it clear would be um, very helpful. And also, and I think this is really key to the whole housing discussion, um, <coughs> thank you for eliminating the section of Chapter 117, Municipal Planning and Zoning, that um, eliminates the any 10 people may appeal a zoning decision. And um, if you get rid of that section, these are the people who would still be able to appeal. A person owning title to the property, a host municipality, an adjoining municipality or solid waste district, a person in the immediate neighborhood who can demonstrate a fiscal or environmental impact on that person's interest, any department or administrative subdivision of the state owning any interest in property, and the agency of commerce and community development. So, so what you are really doing when you um, eliminate that any 10 person section is you're focusing the uh, appeal rights on those entities and people that would actually be affected by the decision. Um, we've done a lot of reading um, over the last couple of years around the, the whole issue of appeals and the fact that, um, we discussed this the other day, and the fact that people who have a vested interest who are in the neighborhood, of course they're going to come to the public hearings and they're going to get involved and they're going to try and appeal. The people who might be there if the units were built who would like to live there, they don't have that same vested interest. And so there's really not any way to represent that interest need priority in the uh, appeal process. I don't know what you do about that. There have been articles in Governing Magazine around that whole issue right. okay. um, in the New York Times in seven days. But um, it is something that I think we need to be mindful of. The voice of the future beneficiaries. Right, um, right. Even how do we represent? Like them? our witness yesterday mm -hmm. was living in a hotel mm -hmm. for seven months. Mm -hmm. yeah. To know which towns in the radius of commute from there, you need to go talk to. You don't. Right. If you see any great ideas in Governing Magazine, you know, let us know. But I think I mean a lot of times we're creating affordable housing task forces and commissions and yeah you know you had right. the housing director in Burlington who used to go to the same meetings and so and you have the YIMBY, um, YIMBY groups, groups which yeah. um, 
I really like that idea, but um, but uh, still, you know, you have to have the time and the wherewithal yes. and the and the, and you have to have the party. dedication really yeah. to you go. You have to have the party status. Yeah. I mean, you, it, it, yeah. So I, I think it's an interesting question. How do we represent the voice of future beneficiaries? I, I think that's a good question. Well, it would be a good question for an intern as a project. To it take might a look be. at NCSL and all the other sources that might say, tell us how others are dealing with this problem, if at all. Where's Peregrine? Yes, where is Peregrine when we need it? Peregrine's working meeting. on other things. Okay, wow. Well. <laughs> But What's on the issue on this? Yeah. But it, it is, it, that's a classic intern project. Yeah. yeah. You have one. I don't. Okay. Go forth and do okay. brilliant. Yeah. So, <laughs> we had a conversation <laughs> yesterday with the UVM uh, College of Arts and Sciences, and they really want to get interns involved in, in these kinds of issues in municipal. Mm -hmm. So I might suggest that one to them. Um, with respect to Act 250, we're, we're very concerned that the bill does not sufficiently revise Act 250 jurisdiction of residential and mixed use developments. Um, Act 250 often gives project opponents multiple opportunities to appeal and to take several bites at the apple and ultimately to reduce the size of proposed housing developments. We've heard numerous stories of um, developers, both private and nonprofit, uh, who have restricted the size of their developments to below 10 units or whatever the number of units is that gets you to Act 250 jurisdiction so they don't need to um, go through that process. Uh, we think it's very important to eliminate Act 250 jurisdiction in designated downtowns, new town centers, neighborhood development areas, and growth centers. Um, uh, we need to define the state standards for act for administration of Act 250 criteria, and you could um, have a system whereby um, municipalities um, certify that they are taking on that um, that responsibility, and not have the double permitting um, at the local level on Act 250. Uh, you will hear from the Mayor's Coalition very strong advocacy around eliminating Act 250 jurisdiction. And then um, we think that you really need to eliminate altogether the language in Act 250 that establishes jurisdiction based on um, construction of housing projects um, constructed or maintained on a tractor tracts of land owned or controlled by a person within a radius of five miles and within any continuous period of five years. There really is not um, any reason that we can think of that you would penalize a person who's developing housing just because they're having more than one development within five um, miles of each other or within five years. I mean, what we want is for them to build housing. Right. And you've so, seen some of these sections start to take shape in our bill. Right? We we have. They they Not seem the to dimension, they <laughs> seem to um, all be somewhat qualified and not. But we think you really just need to eliminate that provision. Um, Representative Sims has a bill in um, I think it's H one eleven uh, with fifty co sponsors at this point that would. Um, eliminate the Act of 50 jurisdiction in, in designated downtowns and so forth, and would also address the um, language about um, five miles, five years, mm -hmm. 10 units. Um, we strongly support the Section 15 regarding connections to municipal water and wastewater. We've been working on that issue for <coughs> how long, Senator? Very long time. <laughs> Over 25 years. Right, very long. Um, we almost actually secured that change to the statute last year. It was sort of nip and tuck, but in the end, it, it didn't pass. Um, we but worked the, on it pretty hard. Yeah, you did. You did. And the and the agency of natural resources is supportive of that change at, at this point. So. And then we thank you for including the language that would enact the project-based tax increment financing districts. Um, 
I understand our mini that, tips, our project you know, mini tips, tips. That, that there's some consideration of maybe having that in a separate bill, which um, we still support it over right. there, okay. right? <laughs> yeah, I, um, I've told finance that that may be coming. Okay. Trade off, maybe we trade off the big tips because the towns that are really in a position to do them have done them, right? And go to the the smaller tips, and if we can keep the impact on the ed fund or even reduce it, yeah, then I think we've got a good chance. And and we think that that would be very workable. Okay, good. Um, you, you also had an extension in here, I think, for Hartford, um, which ha which also has a separate bill. It's extended. there, and I'm and Barry working City. on a separate bill for Barry yeah. City, oh, so okay. they can go through. Yeah. And if you've got language, I don't have to get the same language from Barry City. I think it's finally been sorted out that someone's introducing Barry, right? Okay. Separately. Me. Yeah, I was going to say you're looking at the I just I emailed the manager and clerk yesterday okay. and said if you can yeah. send me some details. But if you have it drafted up, that would be. I don't have it drafted up, but we okay. could I'll get, get it, it drafted I'll up fairly quickly. In. And Carol Doss is definitely the person that's sort of yep. taking the lead on that for Barry. <coughs> so, as in all things for Barry. Because that, yeah, could, that could just tie this bill down or That's, get it set yeah. Yeah. to finance where if there's an right. issue with TIFs and there always mm -hmm. is, um, right. it, it could get bogged down. Or finally, finance could see the light. But this committee will still advocate. Yes. Yeah. So, well, well, the well, half of the committee is on that committee. <laughs> yeah, so. exactly. <laughs> right. It is economic. So many TIFs may be the future of TIFs is what you're saying. I think in Vermont, yeah. I, I think they may be. I mean, particularly coupled with the auditors. The so. auditors coming in next week. Yeah. To yeah. talk about Burlington. Oh, so he has two women in Karen. Oh, wow. Right. Well, see what happens to half an hour? It's true. And we also <laughs> support the propo your proposals in the bill to fund the variety of housing programs. Um, <coughs> that's not just an addendum. Thank you very yeah. much for doing that. And we're, we're happy to um, come back or answer other questions or have conversations or right. if you need so to mobile home, answer. All that other stuff. Yeah, the so mobile uh, home, like the missing no the VHIP, the, um, we, and long range plan for um, hotels. I just have a couple questions. Um, do you have any towns right now that are making it illegal for people to sleep in their cars? I have not heard that. Okay. No. We're just in the house, a homelessness crisis, you know. Right. And I just wanted to make sure you weren't starting to hear of trends toward criminalizing. I've not heard okay. that. I well, I'm just, I'm, you know, it always pops up. I, um, I read an article about it in another state just recently. I, I don't remember where, but um, I don't think that we have those kinds of efforts in Vermont. I think cities are pretty careful okay. around those issues. Another issue brewing, and I will use a similar preface to yours about an unpopular opinion. Potentially, I don't want to poke theirs prematurely, but you know, one thing, I mean, we're starting to hear a couple things, right? You're, you have planning commissions doing great work. We have great plans, and then there there can be appeals to votes where the majority, right? Sometimes it's not the individual going and advocating at a, mm -hmm. at a meeting, but it's the collective community saying, yes, I want my grandkids to be able to live here. I right. want more housing. I want to yeah. enact the plan we said, and there's still appeals possible after a vote is what we're starting to hear. So um, you're, you're talking about the after a vote on a particular, on a particular project, project exactly. decision? Yeah. Well, there's so many opportunities for appeal. So you can, you can, a zoning administrator can make a decision, or the development review board can make a decision, and then the, and then it gets appealed. Um, with housing projects of any size, it's almost always appealed. Mm -hmm. um, and then the DRB will, um, like, affirm its decision or. Uh, 
or address the ZA's, the zoning administrator's decision, and then you can go to environmental court. Mm -hmm. And the, do their appeals get narrowed if there's been a vote to say that the majority of the community? Oh, you can always petition for a re-vote if on any vote, if at least in yeah, well, a lot really of the town, sure. I don't know about okay. towns, but in cities with charters, okay. you, if, because well, that, yes, if yeah. you're adopting a zoning bylaw, for, for instance, we, we just had a municipal planning grant to um, rewrite our zoning bylaws to be more hospitable to um, housing, and we've done everything that's in this bill. Um, oh, one other comment was making accessory dwelling units a public building is going to really kind of kill people's interest in building accessory dwelling that's units. That's public building. Oh, that's in, set, in Representative Bongar's okay. bill. Yeah, that. I think it's in okay. here. I, yeah, I think it is in ours, okay. but I think, I think we need to tweak We haven't okay. talked about that, and that definitely needs to be What does that mean, though? Like a fair yeah. housing. It's kind of um, it, so so. Oh. What the language would do? I think it is in your bill. What the language would do is um, say that an accessory dwelling unit is a public building for purposes of fire and safety oh, code. Well, it has and to be fire and well, it isn't right now. And so, but so you have you have your single family house, and you're going to build you know the the accessory dwelling unit on the side of it you're going um, to do an extension that's going to be a public building so but i i think we need discussion of that yeah, because we can discuss that we exactly. are making it possible for it the to cost be. if you right. have to sprinkle it which you do in publicly rented buildings or if you so if you have to put in sprinklers yeah. and you have an old farmhouse right it's a, it's Mont, just it's an issue yeah right? okay. the montpelier yeah. had a sprinkling requirement okay for any new construction or um, any major rehab, right. okay. it added it can add thousands okay. of dollars depending on if you have to replumb your entire house mm -hmm. to do the sprinkles, and then you get in to water pressure, and if there's enough mm -hmm. to but meet the cover. There is a balancing act between it being publicly available for public rent. And, and still being in a, a home or a, a, on a lawn. So I, I mean, I think it's a balancing act that we have to both protect the public and and make it for it a lot For a lot of, I just want to say out loud on Friday, because next week we're going to try to find time to start, you know, hearing other issues, hearing how we're all feeling about the bill. I've asked Senator Harrison to just really dig into these sections and take okay. feedback and bring future iterations forward, so. Um, Senator I'd like an update on something we did last year, which is the, you know, I'm heart sick, the rental registry didn't go through, as you all know, um, but I do want an update on how the town health officers and the inspectors uh, situation is working out. You may not want to give it today, you may not be prepared to give it today, but I would love to know how that is working out as we add new inspectors and as they go statewide. I don't believe there's been any rules written yet by the um, Division of Public Safety around. So we are having them in, so we yeah. have to so that's a nice quick call. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So okay, thank you. Thank you for so the much. Time. We probably will have you back in, but we'll also hope okay. that, you know, in other conversations you can share suggestions. And, yeah. okay. Thank you. Thank you. I think one of the things I'm struggling yeah. with is when you talk about an accessory dwelling unit, mm -hmm. when that was first put out, it was like a grandmother of yeah. mm -hmm. right. right. which means it's the room over the garage or the room on the mm -hmm. third floor that grandma lives in and I put a bathroom in and maybe she's got a microwave and a mini fridge. Right. When you talk about a rental unit yeah. as a public building, that means I now have to build a fire escape for grandma to the third floor. I will say and a lot of this came up because we started putting public money into yes. ADUs as a housing collection. So I do think we'll need to look at the definition of ADU. That's come up a lot yeah. and we have one, but I would like us all to look at it and know that we feel good about it. Zeke, thanks for your patience. No worries, thank you. Um, Thanks for, for coming in.
Yeah, thanks for having me, everybody. So I'm Zeke Davison. I'm the COO of Summit Properties. Uh, we're the largest private developer of affordable and mixed income communities here in Vermont. Uh, we've developed Thank about- Thank you. No, you're welcome. It's our pleasure. Um, we've developed over 700 rental homes um, in Rutland County, Addison County, Caledonia County, uh, and Chittenden County. Uh, we've also developed another 500 rental homes in New Hampshire and upstate New York. Uh, and on our affordable housing property management side, we manage um, all of our own units, but also Forever North, Cots in the Burlington area, and some other private um, affordable housing developers. Over what time frame, the 700 units? 700 units was dating back to our founders in the 80s, but about 100 of those have been brought online in the last two years. And the next part I was going to say, we're also under development right now on 94 units in South Burlington, 71 of those. Um, permanently affordable and 20 will be for people who are coming out of homelessness or at risk of homelessness through coordinated entry. Um, and that project was, you know, kind of represents one of the most ambitious, most cost effect, uh, efficient, quick to close in this ARPA funded um, affordable housing priority era that we're in. Big thanks to VHFA, that funding stack included funds from ARPA funds from VHCB, a CDBG um, award, local ARPA funding, um, it was, it was a true uh, uh, testament to what uh, ambitious projects can be in, in today's uh, uh, funding world that you guys have all, all approved over the last couple of years. Um, our next project, the net, what we're, you know, that one's under construction now, the next one we're working through permitting on, um, it's a smart growth, mixed income, 200 home project in Middlebury. It's the one that the governor mentioned in his opening address uh, to all of you. Um, and this bill could have a really beneficial impact on that. Uh, the removal of the population-based caps for priority housing projects, it's section 12, page 14 of this bill, uh, would save hundreds of thousands of dollars, six to 12 months in permitting, uh, and reduce the uncertainty and, and risk that the appeals process of Act 250 uh, causes. So the project uh, started as a partnership between us and Middlebury College. They came to us oh, okay. a few years ago saying, uh, we are in desperate need for workforce housing. Um, and we were able to bring Middlebury's resources and their urgency for housing in the town of Middlebury uh, and uh, together to purchase what was the perfect smart growth lot in the town of Middlebury. Um, and, and the project started as a partnership with us in the college, but it's grown to include the community. We've held public info sessions, took feedback, um, uh, all of it positive and, and um, encouraging about density. Uh, the town of Middlebury, we're working with them to jointly file some municipal applications, uh, CRRP, CDBG, NBRC, um, the Porter Hospital, the other large employer in, in the town of Middlebury, um, is supportive and on board, the National Bank of Middlebury, the Addison County Economic Development Corp listed this as their number one priority on their, prior, on their 2023 priority project list. Um, we submitted our first application to VHFA's, uh, we supported the first application to VHFA's Missing Middle uh, home ownership program, which you all championed and passed in the last legislative session. Uh, we're going through town zoning right now, and uh, we're going through a robust environmental review that's required of all of our federal and, and state funding resources. So that sort of sets the scene as a town, even before this project, uh, and unrelated to, to, this, to, to what we're proposing, Middlebury's done all the work the state has asked of it. Um, it applied for and received a neighborhood development area designation uh, after a two-year bylaw modernization project. Uh, it's got robust zoning bylaws um, that include, you know, that key in on areas for smart growth, this parcel included, that were debated and adopted in a, in a truly democratic process in the town of Middlebury. Um, and the need for affordable housing, I think we all, it's sort of a known that we all know, but it's, it's particularly acute in Middlebury. Middlebury uh, has one of the, has I think the sixth highest jobs to homes ratio in the state of Vermont. That's behind a couple of the ski towns, Stratton and Killington also. Um, uh, meaning that th th this need is now, the need is acute, uh, and it really needs ambitious solutions. So after all of these tailwinds, after all of this effort by the town, the project will be subject to Act 250 because we're proposing more than 75 units in a town of a population between 6,000 and 10,000 people. There is a town of 9,200. Uh, the result of that, uh, addition of hundreds of thousands of dollars, fees and consultants, we know that. Uh, delay of six to nine months at minimum after going through the state uh, the town zoning process will then have to submit an Act 250 application and then as we're all talking about the risk of appeal um, by you know one objector and that it's uncertainty risk and potentially additional time and, and cost to what to what uh, just the, the basics of applying through Act 250. So we're trying to match the ambition of this project um, 
with the housing crisis, with the need in Middlebury, uh, but Active 50 is a genuine risk and a, and a genuine barrier. Um, and for really this type of, this reason, uh, impactful affordable housing developments rarely happen outside of Chinon County. So of the 10 towns that have a population over 10,000, and that's where there is no unit cap for towns over 10,000, um, six of those are in Chinon County. The other four are Rutland, Bennington, Rattleboro, and Hartford. Um, the population based cap regime that we currently have, which you guys are proposing to eliminate, I'm, I'm, I'm here to support, um, forces developers outside of Chittenden County to either scale down projects or, or incur that risk. Um, and, it's, and it is duplicative in these designated areas. As I talked about, we're going through the environmental re uh, review, we're going through a three-step zoning process that's been approved by a state, received the, the neighborhood des uh, designation. Um, and this is after you know, the democratic process of the planning, the coding, and the town development review board. Um, so de dense, smart growth development really is the answer to affordable housing. You guys, I've, I've managed to watch at one and a half speed, so it's a little nicer to be slower here, but all of your testimony so far this week. Um, and you know, you've heard you it, know right? You could do that. Yeah, it's, it's nice. It's nice. You can double time it too, and it really goes. YouTube wouldn't let me do that, but one and a half was enough to get the point. Yeah, but you know, you've heard it this week. We're in a housing crisis. We want to preserve Vermont's countryside and ag lands. We want to reduce transportation emissions. We want walkable communities. Uh, we want to fight homelessness, and, and we want to champion social and economic justice. Um, the population-based caps really are, are disincentivizing us um, accomplishing all those and, and really utilizing uh, the smart growth areas. Um, <coughs> our plan is to charge forward. Um, it's what we do. Uh, it's our mission. It's what uh, the town wants. It's what the, the employers in Addison County want. Um, uh, we'll take that risk, and we're also lucky to have a, a, an employer like Middlebury sort of come to the table and, and uh, added another tailwind. Uh, if we did take the pass, the least resistance, we proposed 74 units. Um, as many developers understandably would, it's the you know 75 and over triggers Act 250 in towns between 6,000 and 10,000. Um, we'd scale down the project, not accomplish the density and the perfect smart growth parcel in Middlebury would go underutilized. Uh, the homes are needed, and the result would be the next the next woodlands, the next field um, are going to end up being developed. Um, and in the meantime, people will continue to drive mostly combustion engine cars from Rutland County, Chittenden County, or the best place to find affordable housing in Addison County, upstate New York. Um, so I think this would be negating the good planning uh, that, that the state has done, Jacob's office, um, uh, that the legislature has done. And I don't really think it achieves the, the, uh, the intent of Act 250 either. So really removing the, the population-based caps as this bill um, proposes is, is going to have a, it's, it's a big, you know, the caps are a barrier on affordable housing, yeah. especially outside of Chittenden County. And I, I come to you kind of with, with one project today so to sort of lay out the tangible impact those are having. It's been, it's been hard enough for decades because of land use uh, rules and decisions and, 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 and the uh, availability uh, for people with sort of not in my backyard voices to, uh, to come in late in the game. And uh, this is really an, an opportunity to take a scalpel to Act 250 to make a really big impact. Maybe that's a hard word to use for those who for the rest of Act 50, but scalpel maybe. We always precision. try. Precision. Yeah. Um, are there any energy features about your project that are worth discussing? Ways that you're trying to build a bridge into the future of some post fossil fuel. Yeah, and BHFA has been on the forefront of this. Anything, anything uh, um, multifamily buildings built uh, with BHFA yeah. funding are are. Um, you know, achieve uh, efficiency Vermont's high performance track. So we'll certainly be looking at that um, in talks now, geothermal, solar, um, plan to go all electric. Um, there's a whole other conversation of, of, that I think you guys touched on, maybe it was with Gus earlier uh, this week about, uh, you know, stretch codes, the cost that creates right. and, and the policy decisions that we want to make around that. But yes, I mean, we're, we're exploring every avenue and, and all of our new construction does be really high energy efficiency standards. Okay, so the kind of standard that feels feasible and, and valuable to me is efficiency Vermont's high performance track. Yeah, I mean, it's sort of, uh, it's the gold standard, if you will. It's not the gold standard, I guess. You could always do passive house standard or something like that, but it is a, it, it is a policy decision that, that the agencies in the state have made on, on what is what, what our affordable housing that we intend to last 30 to 50 years, you know, should be. Sounds good. Any other questions? If yeah. In an ideal world, Zeke, how uh, what's your what's your timeline on the two hundred uh, additional units? Uh, 
difference? When, when are you hoping to have them finished? By 26? Um, Act 250 or no Act 250? I said in your it's idea. Both, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> our town zoning process that we've started with three parts, right? Sketch plan, preliminary plan, final plan. Um, that process alone, best case scenario, will, will take us through the end of the summer. Uh, if we were to be able to secure in the meantime, we're going on the parallel track and trying to secure all the funding we possibly can, uh, we could break ground this fall. Um, if we knew we had to apply for Act 250, we would do it probably after the preliminary plan. Um, so that would be maybe midsummer. That's six to nine months baseline. So we're looking at if there are no objectors, if there are no issues, if there are ideal know, world, you'd have it finished <coughs> by the end of 24. 200 units? No, we would bring 50 to 100 units online, middle of 24, end of 24. Um, without Act 250, that gets into 25. All 200 units, talking about absorption, availability of funding, we're into 25, 26. Yeah. Senator Brown. The cost impact between uh, Act 250, yes, and Act 250, no, on a per unit basis, do you have a sense of what that might be? Yeah, so I think the, the we can do the best case scenario, which is the filing fees, right? Um, that's going to add at least $1,000 per unit, even on a really ambitious scale project like this. Um, uh, but the cost really starts to add up in, in duplicative consulting fees, uh, legal fees if there is an objection, uh, uh, you know, interest on construction costs if there's a delay, if you've already started you know, incurring pre-development expenses. That's what I'm trying to do is just get a, get a sense of the elements of cost right. that by adding Act 250 to a project like this, what does it mean when it comes for that individual home to be offered for sale? How much does a consumer have to pay extra for that? Uh, because once you get an idea of that, then it, makes, it becomes easier for us to evaluate the mm -hmm. value of having it. Mm -hmm. It totally depends on the size of the uh, project. Right? If we were to do a 100 unit project, I mean, we know that the, the filing fees and, and uh, our baseline is going to be over $100,000. There's a cap in being in a priority housing project in an NDA. There are reductions in the filing fees. Um, but it, I mean, I've, again, don't quote me, I guess, but, but it's, it's a few thousand dollars. Well, there would also be the time value. So then what I was going to add layer on is the time value, the risk, right, as soon as we start to put premium. Exactly. How it is, is, you know if anybody's actually tried to quantify anything like that? So, it, it is so variable. I, yeah. We thought about trying to do it for the per, you know, because in right. anticipation of that exact question, and there are just so many variables. I would say, best case scenario, we fly through Act 250. It's all perfect. We're doing 200 units. It's, it's $1,500 to $2,000 per year. Wow. Yeah, and, you and, you and, said 1000 a unit. It's now going up. No, no, that was just the final. Oh, that's just the final. Yeah, okay. right, right. And then that's not adding on like a risk premium um, mm -hmm. and, and legal fees, things like that, if there is an appeal. Yeah, legal fees aren't free. Right. And, and the one thing I do want to comment there is this is we're doing affordable and workforce housing, mm -hmm. right? I mean, we're, we're that, that, that cost is borne by either <laughs> VHFA, VHCB, the legislature through, through subs additional subsidy we're going to need mm -hmm. uh, to construct those units or it's passed on to the consumer, it's passed on to the buyer, the renter, to the extent that's even possible. And so one of those impacts ends up being, if you, if you end up being too, too inefficient on your building cost, the project just doesn't get done. Um, and that's sort of why we've always focused on really high quality build, um, but really cost efficient. And that's what, that's what allows us to do these types of projects at scale. Thank you so much. Um, we sh we have to. Well, always well I know. Your That's okay. Task, raise your hand. Yeah. <laughs> no, I can ask questions, questions later, and I will have. Yes, you can listen to some things. Yeah. Yes, I know. I'll stay. I'll stay for a minute if you don't mind. Talk on the break. Yeah. Thank you so much, Steve. Thank you all. Thanks. Um, we have Joe. Do you need? Oh, good. Okay, I didn't know something was coming up. Jonah Richard on uh, Zoom. Hi. Hi. Good morning, folks. Good morning. Um, yeah, you, you just want to state your name for the record. I think everyone can hear you from the Good Morning Anchor. That's... Uh, yeah, my name is Jonah Richard, uh, small scale developer and, and general contractor in Bradford. Great. So, yeah, just um, hoping you can share your thoughts on the bill. Um, Absolutely. Um, so, first, th thank you. Thank you all for, <laughs> for inviting me today. Uh, 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 this is a, a, a great opportunity and, and appreciate you looping in some of the smaller developers. I know you, you're 
you're likely speaking with some of the larger scale folks, uh, but it's nice to have a seat at the table as, as someone that develops smaller uh, multifamily projects. Um, so a little, little background on myself. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm a developer and general contractor at Bradford. I focus on small multifamily uh, housing projects here between two and 20 units. <clears throat> I'm currently building uh, a nine unit mixed use project. So retail and uh, and residential in Fairley uh, that, that kicked off uh, in, in March of last year and set to wrap up uh, this spring. So there's a lot of uh, that goes into construction project, obviously, uh, with, with risk, uh, complexity, and uncertainty. Uh, and that's been uh, exasperated by interest rates and, and constru rising construction costs uh, in the past uh, few years. Um, but there are two two things from policy standpoint that I'd like to uh, that I'd like to discuss here uh, that I'm finding as uh, end up being blockers uh, for for the small scale development work that I'm doing uh, in Orange County. Um, so the first is Act 250. I'm sure you've heard quite a bit about this. I, I just was listening to the gentleman uh, beforehand uh, speak speak to this as well. Uh, so not only does it affect larger projects, but it affects uh, uh, you know, folks like myself doing smaller scale projects as well. Um, so I'm, I'm not by no means a cat, uh, an expert here. I'm just starting to get acquainted with the act, uh, particularly because it's starting to affect the work that I'm doing. Um, so for context, again, uh, this this nine unit uh, in Fairly that I'm doing is drawn to a close. And so I'm trying to figure out, or I've, I've been working on uh, 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 determining what my next project will be. Um, I had a site picked out in Fairly. It's a, uh, a small, uh, you know, small, small site um, suitable for a three-unit project, uh, triplex. Um, and I recently, in speaking with my attorney and some folks at the state, learned that if I went through with that project, uh, it would trigger Act 250 uh, due to the 10-5-5 rule. So 10 units and a 10, 10 units in a five-mile radius within five years uh, would trigger Act 250 for me. And so that called into you know, some questions on what, what that associated cost and risk would be uh, on my standpoint. So there are a couple of costs that I'm sure you, you all are aware of. So you have application fees, which add 7% to the project or 0.7% to the project. You have attorney's fees, you have delays in construction. You know, we need to hire experts uh, to provide proof that we're, we're meeting each of the 10 criteria. Uh, and these quickly add up to uh, uh, tens of thousands of dollars of costs uh, for, for a small project, even such as a triplex, um, even before we know that the project can be built, right? And so also we have to take into account the, uh, you know, the time and cost going to zoning uh, before going into Active 50 uh, and quickly becomes untenable, the project, just due to the risk and, and upfront costs. And especially as a small scale developer, uh, you know, I don't, I don't have tens of thousands of dollars of capital put at risk uh, when that project might not go forward. Um, so, uh, so what this effectively meant for me is that I, I'm not going to pursue that, that triplex and I have to find another project outside of that five mile radius, uh, so that I don't have to, you know, bear the added weight and burden and cost of, of going through Act 250. Um, and so, you know, just thinking through the implications understood that Act 250 is meant to one hand, you know, uh, preserve the uh, the character of our of our great Vermont towns, um, but it actually seems to be undermining uh, that goal by inhibiting small scale developers like myself um, from continuing to build small scale projects. Uh, and instead, it guides me, uh, you know, like it or not, to pursuing larger scale projects that might not fit within the context of our smaller towns, um, just because that's the kind of project that can absorb the risk and cost of of Act, an Act 250 application. Uh, I heard some questions uh, uh, previously as well on, on the cost, the actually getting some hard numbers on the cost uh, of what Act 250 uh, uh, would add to a project. Uh, and I was just doing some back of the envelope uh, math uh, uh, before I got on. Um, and so a gentleman previously mentioned $1,000 to $2,000 range per unit um, for a large scale project. That increases on a per unit basis for someone like myself, where, uh, you know, call it a a uh, six unit project we're doing for a million dollars uh, would add, you know, three, three to $4,000 per unit uh, in, in added costs. And what that translates to in, in the rental market, I, I do, uh, I do mostly rental projects uh, is about $50 a month in, in increase uh, of rent that gets passed on to the uh, passed on to the consumer. Uh, the second, the second policy thing I'd like to, I'd like to talk about is financing. 
uh, particularly for small scale affordable housing projects. Uh, there's plenty of financing out there for market rate projects, conventional loans, et cetera. But when you move to the, the affordable uh, realm, uh, that gets really sparse uh, for, for folks like myself. Um, so, for, uh, for example, uh, the project, the nine unit project I, I spoke about before and fairly that had no affordability subsidy. Uh, we did that with, you know, their market rate rents and we went through conventional uh, loan and equity programs to, to, to get the capital needed. Um, and so as a result, what we're looking at is $1,300 a month for a studio and $1,700 a month for a one bedroom. Um, and this, this is, these are numbers that barely cover operating expenses, debt payments, uh, and offer a, a slight marginal return to, to investors for, for putting in their capital. Um, so put simply, I, I can't build affordable housing projects with conventional uh, uh, with conventional uh, loan and, and uh, loan programs without sacrificing quality. Um, so I need some, you know, I would need some sort of subsidy to bring those rents down uh, to something more manageable for our lower or, or middle income uh, uh, brackets um, in, in town. So for the past six months, I've kind of been running an experiment, trying to find uh, uh, affordable housing programs that would work for a project's, projects of my scale. Um, and so the project that I'm working on next is a six unit uh, project outside of my five mile Act 250 range in Bradford, Vermont, uh, where I currently live, uh, that I'd like to make uh, it turn into 100% affordable housing. Um, so the project's in great setting, uh, downtown Bradford, highly walkable, close to shops, close to restaurants, close to, uh, more importantly, jobs uh, downtown. Uh, and the only the only other affordable housing projects in our town of 5,000 uh, are these two 21 unit uh, projects, both set on the outskirts of, of town. So there's nothing really, uh, not only is there a lack of, of affordable housing in town, but there's a lack of, of affordable housing in our core downtown uh, area. So I've looked through a, a number of different programs. I won't get into them all. Uh, Vermont Housing Improvement Program, VHIP, which you all are familiar with, uh, is, is good as a part of the capital stack, $50,000 per unit, but that is not enough nearly to cover the $175,000 per unit in construction costs that we have. Um, and so that in and of itself will not work for, for a 100% affordable housing project. It can be a part of it, but it can't, uh, can't, can't uh, uh, capture all of our needs. Um, there's the Upper Valley Loan Fund uh, in our Upper Valley region that was established as a consortium of local employers looking to promote workforce housing. Uh, I applied for that, instantly rejected because my project does not meet uh, the 30 unit threshold. And this is a common theme. They have a lot of these programs have thresholds of 25, 30, 40 units. And if you are below that, uh, you know, you're not they won't they won't they can't work with you uh, for whatever reason. Um, federal uh, lie tax, so low-income housing tax credits, again, generally only reserved for, for larger scale programs. And then we have VHCB, uh, which has their ARPA SFR funding, which also traditionally is used for larger scale projects, but they've been, I've been working with them the past three or four months. They've been willing to work with me on a small scale project, but the uh, this is kind of new territory for them, and it's unclear whether this project will work for uh, for that specific program. But net net of the matter is, there's not a lot of uh, funding opportunities for me to take advantage of to be able to offer 100% affordable housing uh, in, in town here. And so I connected with uh, Seth Leonard at VHFA, who uh, you know we discussed this this new missing uh, missing middle income uh, housing loan program. Uh, that he's uh, helping to draft uh, that would that would make a really big impact on projects of my scale focused on two to 20 unit housing projects um, that could bridge the gap, uh, you know, when coupled with a program like VHIP um, could actually allow us to deliver housing at call it between 80 to 100 percent of, of, of AMI. So 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 workforce housing. Um, I know I only have 15 minutes, so I'll, I'll pause there. And if you folks have any questions for me, I'm happy to answer them. Questions for Jonah? Uh, just a request, if you could um, send us your testimony, it'd be really helpful. You know, um, email it. Absolutely. Okay. Sure. Okay. I've noticed great. there's a delay. <laughs> oh, okay. say that out loud. People keep talking when there's silence. Right. I, it's really interesting to hear from a, a small scale developer. Um, yeah. Thanks for being here and to understand the, the financing that you're looking at. Now, the Upper Valley Fund is interesting because that's that's a 
good effort from uh, it is. locals. Right. So uh, have you talked to them about changing their parameters? I mean, they would have that ability to, to change their standards. They're, they're not a bank or someone. Yeah, yeah so I, no, I, uh, I have. I, I think the, the major issue, I think the real reason these programs do this is just because of administrative overhead. Uh, it, you know, they can have a lot more impact with the limited budget that they have for administrative back, at, back end operations to do larger scale units than a bunch of smaller scale projects. And so I just don't think they're yet set up to be able to handle, you know, six to 10 unit unit projects. That said, they, they did express interest in, in continuing the conversation. Hopefully that, that translates into something that uh, either either opens up that uh, the, the pool of money to smaller scale to de smaller scale developers or creates a separate set of funding for for projects of, of my size. Thank you. Yeah, no, I'm just for a town you know, a 30 unit project in a town like Fairley or Bradford is going to have a major impact and might get some more pushback. Infill in those kinds of towns are much likely to be in the three, four, ten, yes. the smaller right. projects. And that may be, yeah, because a hundred units wouldn't be appropriate for those towns that's right. exactly it there, there's a lot of there's a lot of smaller scale infill lots that are available for development that can only fit you know between two to ten units uh they can't handle the scale that a traditional affordable housing developer is going to need to deliver you do mixed and you've got a small lot you might be able to do two three four apartments above a retail but not without building a monster. Exactly. Yeah, and remember one of the early partners on, on funding that Upper Valley Fund is the hospital, and you're right, their notion of solving this problem is 100 units in Lebanon. Wow. So, I mean, it, it, yeah, and infill is Lebanon, program. that might work. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, That's yeah. New Hampshire, so. <laughs> <laughs> thanks. Well, but it's for both sides. Okay. Thanks so much, Jonah. If you don't mind me saying so, that's a beautiful space, too. You have great taste. Awesome. So, nice <laughs> thank you for uh, My partner help. decorated it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I can't yeah. take credit. Yeah. I'm aging the Pine Bureau behind him. I know. We're like, we're, <laughs> we're admiring the antiques. <laughs> I, I, I'm looking at the plants. I was looking at the plants, too. <laughs> anyway, so thank much. you for so joining. We'll get him in the <laughs> office with the, okay. with the chair. <laughs> And you're welcome to stay on Zoom and listen, um, or you know, you might be busy. So I have to duck back out to the construction site. We're trying to wrap up, but um, I appreciate your your time and uh, uh, thank you for for the opportunity. Thanks a lot. Thank Thanks. So I know there was a request to switch order, but I am actually going to use my chair's prerogative to keep the order, just okay. because we don't always have the natural resources board in here, and I want to make sure. We give you as much time as we need and that might sorry jacob that might bring us right to 10 30 and we have you more often and we've already had you in the okay. next year if that's okay yep. and our presentation is not we've tried to keep it within the 15 minutes we have time, lots of questions with time, for, room. So, with time for questions okay so, well we'll yes. i think you know you're you're a missing link in this story so <laughs> we might have you that's next a, year for longer yeah. <laughs> And you can pull up a chair so that both of you, yeah. however. Okay, great. Yeah, let me, uh, yeah. I hope I won't get any feedback here, but let me get the Zoom link open. Or you could also send it to uh, Scott, and Scott can run it. I think it's really like so it's nice. luxury it's to use. I'll just pull one of those stages to the there. You can't do that. I don't want to pull up that. Have a witness walk behind you. We can join without video, right? That'd be the best way probably. Otherwise, we just twice, right? Yeah, we'll pull up the slides. Oh, okay. I misunderstood what you were saying. Excuse me. Oh, yeah. Okay. With, with him, I meant, yeah. Um, yeah. Are 
are you, am I leaving this in your good hands, right? Yeah, it's, um, <laughs> that's brave of you. That's brave of you. I think, I think we've only met Peter a few times. I'm, yeah, we would love to have, I mean, you're not often in our committee, uh, you know, so. Right. Well done, we have one new senator. And yeah, well, I know she's last time. I recognize the place to live in Dallas Falls. Oh, great. So that was, that was nice to see that connection. <laughs> but um, are you ready for me all to begin? Yeah, as okay. long as you're good. Uh, one second on the okay. tech side of things. Sorry to hold it. Okay, so I'll just do a share screen and we should be good to go. Thank you. Get me for everybody. Perfect. Yeah. Well, we're do I will say, I think for the general watching public, it's better if people do bring their own slides in because Scott can do other things and not have to keep yeah. advancing the slides. So I so appreciate it. Okay for good. Good. good for me, good on that side. Okay, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, we all know that housing is at a crisis point in Vermont, and I'm, it's heartening to see all of us working together to move it forward. Uh, I want to thank you for inviting us today and for being part of letting us be part of this conversation. There are lots and lots of different parts to this. And I am Sabina Haskell. I'm the chair of the Natural Resources Board. I've been here uh, 13 months in this role. I've had many other roles around the state, uh, which I won't bore you with, but I recognize a lot of folks. We've seen you in very different capacities. That's right, that's right. And with me today is Pete Gill, our new executive director at the Natural Resources Board. And I'm gonna let you say a few words about yourself before we jump in. Good morning, in. Senators, and thanks for having us. Um, so yeah, Pete, Pete Gill just started as the executive director. I've been here um, for two months um, with a large caveat that uh, uh, prior to that, um, I was, I was with the Natural Resources Board as Associate General Counsel for about eight years, so I have some background in Act 250, but I did have this little uh, interlude, five years at, at Norwich University, and so I've got a lot of education law crammed in my head as well. Um, so getting back into the um, Act 250 realm, and, and very excited to, to be here and, and um, help you guys through navigating uh, Act 250 land. Great, thank you. And thank you very much. And. I'll just jump right in with a few background uh, remarks and then we'll share with you some statistics about the housing units we've permitted mm -hmm. and the PHP units that have not obviously been exempt and everything. But um, just to make the point that everybody already knows, 40,000 units by 2030, according to VHFA, is pretty daunting and we get that. Um, we, the NRB has already been talking with legislators the VLCT, um, environmental advocates, regional and local planners, housing developers, and others to be a part of this conversation and the path forward. So I, I say these remarks to let you know that we're being open-minded and want to, we want to do our part to get there. Um, it's, I would also say that I think it's a shared responsibility that we've all had a role in somehow getting to this bad point, this crisis point, and likewise, we all need to recognize we have a we have a we're all part of the solution as well. Um, we will continue to approach these conversations with the recognition recognition that Act 250 law does need reexamination and modernization to get us there. Um, I'm sure you're all aware that we are uh, working on a legislative report that is due at the end of December. Necessary updates to the Act 250 program. It's due on December 31st. Did oh, no, I just. You can think. Well, okay. December 31st is time passed, yeah. so obviously. Of 2023. Oh, darn. Yeah. Okay. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> if it was due last December, I would have had it done. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Too bad it won't yeah. be. So we have, we have 11 months, or 10 oh, yeah. months at this point, right? Okay. Oh, oh, my God. Amazing. We're making sure we have the slide thing. We're all set. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, <laughs> The, the first directive, there are six different directives in this report, and the first one is to focus on location-based jurisdiction. And this is the regulatory framework that enables the compact growth in areas where we already have development and while at the same time protecting our open spaces, forests, and working landscapes. Um, 
And a good example of these place-based jurisdiction is the state designation programs, and I don't want to steal your thunder, but <laughs> you'll hear more from uh, Jacob about that and how we're recognized in these designated centers. Um, the designated centers were created to target public and private investment, and most of the designations were not intended for use in a regulatory arena, but many are used for that purpose, and it's helpful to build more homes in smart locations. Um, there's a broad stakeholder engagement program to help uh, the Department of Housing and Conservation to evaluate and improve the designation uh, program. They're going to be doing a report as well this year. The RPCs are working on a way to map, consistently map, to show where we should grow and areas to protect. And as you all know, Representative Bongartz has um, another bill, H68, that asks, uh, excuse me, H5, that looks at the way RPCs can explore integrating municipal and regional planning policies, etc. Um, these conversations are going to get, take time. I'm sure we'll be back and see you again. But I'm confident that uh, the NR, as NRB as an organization can come together and help build consensus and find a way to align both state and local regulations for a better, stronger, and more equitable and sustainable communities across our state. Um, we understand that looking at Act 250 and the role it plays has to be part of that solution. Um, I'll take a, just a side step and say that said, as you know, we are blamed many, many times for uh, in these regulatory conversations. And I want to speak on behalf of our staff and tell you that it's not a lot of fun for them to always be the bad guy. But we, they work really hard to administer the law fairly, and we do, we do issue over 400 permits a year, uncontested permits a year, and they're doing, a, they're doing a darn good job. Do you have figures on if something is uncontested, the average time it takes to improve? We do. We, um, we do track timing and how long it takes to get permits through, and they and. Um, by statute, we have to uh, report that information annually in our annual report, which is due to the legislature in two weeks, yes. February 15th, so well, two right. and a half weeks. So perhaps we'll have you back in that time. Yeah. Problem. Just a question in terms of what you track. Uh, do you make any attempt to track how long it takes the a person who applies to prepare the material necessary to make the application, one, and two, uh, to document the cost associated with an Act 250 permit, including the preparation time, costs, experts, and so on. Uh, answer to your first question, do we track how long it takes them to get their application together? We, as far as I know, we do not. It's, we, we get the application, it's reviewed for completeness, and once, uh, if there's information that's missing, we request that the applicant supply that, and then, we deem the application complete, and it goes through a review process with our district commissions. I can people share some money, uh, some information on fees that are assessed to the housing projects in the last six years. But we do hear that as a comment very often that uh, applicants need to invest in consultants and engineers, and so they can so that they're complying with the law, and but we don't keep track so of what no, those costs are. So there's no calculation are. of what Act 250 actually costs to the applicants. That's correct. I, right. And it obviously it differs for each applicant, to your point, right? Would that be something you could track in the future? I think we would have to add a question to the application, and mm -hmm. that might have and then <laughs> And then you, you were relying on the applicant to be sharing that information if you said for you know our analysis we'd like a an estimate or something is that something you could it's sort of again optional not mandatory right. question but one of the things that I, I continually hear is that the act 250 process in terms of the amount of time it takes particularly for those applications that are routinely approved is not the issue nor is the cost of the fee the issue the issue is all the things we have to do and the time we have to take 
before we're able to get an application in in the first place. To get ready, right. Mm -hmm. And now there's just a shortage of availability of those professionals. Mm -hmm. I mean, we also hear from those professionals saying, we want to get out of this business because this is really frustrating for us to have our expertise questioned. We're just tired and we're not going to mm -hmm. keep engaging in this work. I, my mind is going because I'm thinking maybe there's a, there may be a way to get to that and I want to mm -hmm. have a conversation with some folks on the staff about that. So mm -hmm. I'm hearing you and I'll, I'll, I'll let you know. Yeah. yeah, sure. While we're talking about Act 250, as we all know, it was written, this law was written on a typewriter in the late 1960s and it was enacted 53 years ago and um, most of us don't live with typewriters anymore and it is a, it is something that needs refreshing for the way we live today i and that is why we're excited to be embarking on this study that is due december 31st of this year yeah um and while we're i mean we're at a crossroads of a lot of important policy decisions that are affecting housing and the livelihood of vermonters and i believe we need to be open to embracing changes to the Act 250 law. Um, what they will look like, how we get there, that's to be, we'll go through that whole process this year. Are you picking up on themes already? Um, that's a good question. We are, no Act 250 is one of the things, but um, <laughs> all here too. <laughs> right. Um, uh, there's a lot of conversation about trying to not have <coughs> duplicative <coughs> levels of regulatory review with zoning and us. Um, if you're a 10 acre town, in the, you know, if you have robust zoning and um, municipal ordinances, do you need to, do you need Act 250? You know, that's a conversation we've had with the mayors, with Mayor Weinberger. Um, we've talked about whether the possibility of um, that a city like Burlington and others that have that type of robust zoning, could they be exempt from it and try it on a pilot project? I mean, there's lots of different different conversations coming up and we're trying to capture them all for that for that study. That'll be a lot of, I mean, a lot of these things will come up in the conversation about the study is what I'm trying to say. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So turning back to the omnibus housing bill, um, and I know you know about priority housing projects that are then they're exempt from Act 250. There are also fee reductions for the qualified projects located within certain designated centers. And now I'd like to turn it over to Pete, who can uh, provide you a snapshot of where we are with housing projects over the last six years. Last year, we were asked to bring this information to Senate Natural Resources, mm -hmm. and we provided all the different projects, and we've updated it and done a little bit more um, evaluation of it and to, to, come to uh, feed this conversation, is mm -hmm. what I'm trying to say. Happy to take it over. Did you want to touch base on any of this slide? Before oh, yeah, we I forgot about that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so as you know, PHPs have been exempt since 2013. We have reduced fees in the uh, neighborhood uh, development areas. There are no fees for the downtown designated areas, the 6086B process. And then we've been talking about the two reports. So uh, the designated area report that you all are gonna be doing and ours at the end of the year. They're both gonna be kind of simultaneous, if you will. Mm -hmm. I just wanna pause and say, you know, group into what some folks have said testified before you, I had someone from the natural resources world in the legislature come up and say, you know, I hear it's only 3% of the cost to go through Act 250, which first of all, is still a lot. Um, and second of all, if that's, if you take that over the whole life of the project versus when you're up front trying to get capital and, you know, get your permits in place, that's a very different figure, you know, so I think it's always been concerning that this conversation has lived in the Natural Resources Committee and not in the Housing Committee because we're talking about how you get housing built and, you know, Economic looking at a lifetime of a project versus right. to get it going. Right. Exactly. It's, it's very different. Right. So um, when Pete goes through his slides, we've got some um, information in there about the fees that you may or may not find surprising, but back to your point. We hear it often that the cost for applicants to get ready to apply mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So that's not that is not captured in the fees, obviously. Right. Yeah. But we appreciate the reductions. <laughs> Every little bit helps, right? <laughs> um, okay. Should I take it over? Yeah, you will. Yeah. Yep. Um, so uh, just to set the context of, of my next remarks here, just um, wanted to give you kind of the broad brush data. We're still cramming a couple of the numbers, but this is kind of a little preliminary, so you have a little understanding of what we, the data that we have at the moment um, on some of these things, including PHPs. And before I get into that uh, level of the data, I just wanted to um, go through kind of the uh, flow chart on the priority housing um, uh, designations. Don't be too overwhelmed by this <laughs> by this slide because it has a lot of a lot of pieces um, to it. But uh, I'll highlight a couple of areas that I want you to um, focus on or kind of walk you through um, this this chart. And just as a precursor here, the next slide is going to be this same chart um, with an overlay of the bill that is under consideration of this uh, committee, uh, the um, 23DR91. Uh, um, is that it? Yeah. Uh, uh, so, um, so at any rate, um, this uh, this slide um, just direct you first to kind of that upper upper left box. There, you've got um, you know to determine whether your um, priority housing project. That's what this flowchart is is dealing with. And if you look there, you can see there's four different designations that you need to be uh, for your housing in order to be um, priority housing. It's a kind of a threshold issue. Um, and then you go through and you and you decide whether you, you meet the mixed income, mixed use, or any combination of those two. And you can see maybe in small print there off to the right um, the, the definitions for each of those. So nothing that we have to micro focus in on right now, but just so you're aware that those are there. Um, if you don't meet those, you're not a priority housing project. If you are, uh, as long as you meet the thresholds that are in the statute, and those were changed um, per Act, Act 182 last year, um, and you can see sort of what those are, uh, minus a little uh, blockage there from the, the um, screen, the, the, the uh, projection piece. But um, so it, it the um, jurisdictional thresholds. Once you reach these other these other portions, if you're over uh, 10,000. You can have, uh, in terms of your population of that town, um, you can have as many units as, as uh, you desire in that area without uh, triggering. Uh, you can go up to 74 if you're in that population of 6,000 6, to 9,999. 9, um, and then the one you probably can't read there very well is less than 6,000. You can go up to 49 units. Again, if you're <coughs> within those designated areas, um, you've got that population. Then you would be in the you would be a PHP. You would not trigger Act 250 jurisdiction for those projects. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of a sum for that uh, more complicated slide. And that last part is new as of last year. Yes, so there was some tr there were so there was some changes based on the uh, threshold limitations um, last year, um, and so this is up to date as as, uh, as of last year. Can I ask a quick question? Yeah. Did you see any um, uptick of applications? I mean, it's, it's only been a year. year. Um, well, it just got approved. You know, it just went through yeah. uh, July one. Okay, um, so we haven't had time to figure out that. So we have we haven't digested that data, and there's yeah fairly limited amount of time uh, to make those projections. But it's an interesting question. So yeah, I'm I think probably maybe do, have yeah. had yeah. time to. This so. is just with the priority yeah. housing project. Yeah. It's the only thing we did. We, we yeah. just have five minutes, so I'm just going to ask sorry. that. Yeah. 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 Great. Um, so next, just as, a, as an overview, I won't linger on this, but this is just, you can see how the, the bill under consideration um, changes this. Um, you've got some direct lines coming down um, on the priority housing uh, level. You're removing uh, uh, the thresholds. Um, and I believe there's some other uh, changes there, too, but I won't. Get into, I won't linger on that, but just to give you a, a quick visual. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so in terms of uh, PHP tally, kind of the data that we've got, uh, again, initially um, scrubbed on this um, from in a six year period, 2017 to 2022, we're talking about uh, 2,700 priority uh, housing projects uh, that were exempt from Act 250 during that period. So the way we determine that is um, just so you have an understanding is. Uh, Folks can ask for a jurisdictional opinion from our district coordinators, um, and they can determine whether it is a priority housing or not based on those factors that we just looked through. 
Um, and, and if they know it's going to be exempt, there may be some applicants that didn't ask for a jurisdictional opinion, so we can't count them. Mm -hmm. But this we is don't, we from, don't have, we we don't have, have a way to date. count them, is yeah. what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Right. We're, we're guessing that's a limited number of folks. It, the, the anecdotal evidence points that folks will ask for a jurisdictional mm -hmm. opinion in this, <coughs> this instance. Um, but true, it does, it, there may be more. Yeah. There may be more. Um, and then we've got a, a breakdown, rough breakdown here of uh, the various districts where uh, PHPs uh, have been uh, exempt from Act 250. There you can see uh, the distribution uh, in the various districts, and it's got the um, counties that uh, represent those. No surprise, District 4 Chittenden County is the bulk. Not to reflect that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, just a few more, a few more slides. Um, so, and then, so kind of the flip side of the PHP is the housing. What we tried to do in our in our data, and we've done this, I think, over the last couple of years, um, is provide uh, kind of a corollary to the PHP projects. So we're looking at large, uh, uh, fairly large scale um, projects that are for multi multi families. So we're not talking about duplexes and triplexes um, in this in this data. We're looking at a fair overlap of the area within those designated um, areas. So they comparable to what would happen in the PHP realm, if that makes sense. Everybody following? I, I kind of think of it as like this donut and we're um, <laughs> you know, around, around the towns and we're, we're talking about um, an area that fairly well overlaps the same areas as the PHPs. And so within that Act 250, where Act 250 has been triggered, where there isn't a PHP exemption um, because of either they haven't met the unit threshold or the, um, uh, they're not actually right inside of the uh, designated area, for instance. So any of those, we've permitted over 70 uh, plus housing projects. We estimate that to be approximately 3,000 units. So fairly comparable, again, to the um, PHP number within the same kind of um, area. Um, we've got, so within that, when you're looking at process-wise, um, we've got uh, you know, about 90% that are processed as minors without any hearing going through that, that process, um, and then about 10% that are processed as majors where there is a hearing um, involved. Um, and then the fees that uh, Sabina was alluding to earlier, um, it's about uh, 1.4 million in fees that were assessed um, for this, which comes out to about 480 dollars per unit to cover the direct and indirect costs uh, to the Natural Resources Board in administering. But that, that fee number, just so it's clear, um, there is uh, a portion of our fee, overall fee that goes to the Agency of Natural Resources. Um, so this number reflects both of those uh, costs in administration. Um, you just have a couple of minutes, so I feel like yep. I would yep. hone in on anything that we can't really clearly from the other side. Okay, or great. Or go to concluding yep. Yep. thoughts. Is that the last slide? Yep. Yep, this is, this this, is, it. This yep. is the last okay. slide. So great. Yeah, we might have some questions. <laughs> yeah, if you've got some questions. <laughs> are, you, uh, are you reviewing the bill and making comments directly on the bill? or We we are doing that, but we haven't finished. Yeah, right. right. Okay. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, are, do you ever look at, we are hearing about fast tracking processes in New Hampshire or other states that, you know, are you looking at good ideas from other states about how to get housing built more quickly where we want it? Yeah, because that's my question is, what are your ideas for helping fast track Yeah, this? Yeah, we've had these conversations as part of the downtown board, um, but that's, yeah, I think the, that's another part of the... And given the urgency of the housing crisis, I mean, you know, we could talk to you about slide after slide of information about homelessness, the number of jobs versus number of housing listings, yeah. um, the delays that we're already looking at, the 10 year period in which we should have already done this, you know, to be to be bringing more housing online. Do you have ideas that you could share with us this year for changes based on the work you've already done? I would say the most logical one is the designate, you know, continuing the exemptions with designated areas. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's expanding those. Coordinating those and right. keeping the I integrity mean, of the designated areas with. Mm -hmm. with I mean, we were at a uh, housing conference in Lamoille County 
last October or November, and only one of the towns in Lyle County qualified for designated area. Mm -hmm. So, and the exemption. Mm -hmm. So, do you feel so like that's a zoning? That, you know, yeah. Let's a, say we did exempt those areas. Is there anything you feel like would be significantly missing that you contribute right now to the process? I can't, I can't answer that right off the top of my mm -hmm. head, but if they're in designated areas where there's already development and there's wastewater and sewer, et cetera, mm -hmm. and river corridors, which is already in. Mm -hmm. So if we said there's exemptions, but these things have to be in place, that's something you could comment on to make sure that mm -hmm. there's nothing missing that you feel like would otherwise mm -hmm. be captured. Great. Uh, we'll take when you for sure. Super quick. Are there other A and R permits that are required even when a uh, development is exempt from Act Two Fifty? Th things that the towns mm -hmm. don't do or can't do, mm -hmm. like right. stormwater. I don't know. Good. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. So yes. you can let us know <laughs> yes. what those and are. And it depends on the project. Sure. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Yes. Senator Parks. Yeah, no, I just wanted to tag on to Keisha's comment, which is if you do have additional sort of low hanging fruit that coordinates with the work we're already doing, mm -hmm. and because it would be great, I mean, you see it most closely every day, other than the developers. You are more intimately, I mean, you see what we can fix and not fix. I mean, we really, I think this is our opportunity to do some of that with our downtown and village centers. Senator Brown. Do you ask applicants to evaluate? the process and to help you identify glitches in it? You mean the Act 250 permit mm -hmm. process? Yeah. Well, Do you get feedback from the applicants? We get very limited feedback from the applicants in terms of like a survey the, kind of thing. feedback from the applicants? We, Do you seek feedback from the applicants we, in, a pro, in a formal process way? Yeah, we have a, we have a, opportunity to fill out a survey on our website which rarely gets filled out we i mean we get calls from people but we get calls from people yeah, right. <laughs> yes yeah, she, she's very clear yes. yes i guess as we go through this is there something you absolutely feel you should not give up what what are the most vital Precious, yeah. Pressures, yeah. The, you know, where would something really bad happen if we tinkered with it? And just to to build on that, I mean, when we do finally get your report, it would just be nice to see it framed in kind of a, 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 a sense of like aspirational goals you have, that someone doesn't need to have a lawyer to be heard, you know, that this doesn't favor um, those who can afford to get through the process, that you know, this put, creates housing where we want it. And like, I mean, we have our one compact village settlement and it was surrounded by working lands and we lived with that for one, it's great. You know, but now I think there needs to be a next iteration of what the principles are that guide this process when they get this report. The period when we were afraid that all those hippies from the cities were gonna <laughs> move in here and build houses everywhere yes. is over. And so it's time to look at today's reality and how do we do that? Those hippies have a cop. There are the next generation. We're not the oldies that, go, that want to pull yes. up the drawbridge exactly. around the little castle and create it. Cummings, you'll always be a hippie. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, you're the only one. <laughs> Well, thank you so yeah, much. You. We would really like an ongoing exchange. Yeah. Um, we're trying to Ditto. spend the next two weeks really yeah. fine tuning pieces of Okay, material. Ditto. Yeah. So we'll we'll, get, we'll we'll go back and put our heads it. together and be and share what we can come back. Yeah. With. I think it's yeah. good that you're new, okay. frankly. Yes. You know, hopefully it engenders a lot of user experience development of the next the next wave of yep. what Act 250 should look like. Yep. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank yeah. you for having thank us. You. Yeah. Yeah. So we will be back at 10.45. Ah, okay. In 10 minutes. Okay, and we're live. Um, thanks so much, Rachel, for being here. Welcome to this role, I think. I yes. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I made that up. Um, 
as you may know, we had your colleague Kelly in to talk about the labor side of our work in this committee. Yes. Um, but we are eager to talk about the housing side. Um, we currently have provisions in the bill on fair housing, uh, which you know Vermont Legal Aid has been a real leader in making sure that we keep focus on fair housing in the state. Um, we are certainly open to what I will take the liberty of calling like more fully baked ideas co where coalitions have been built around other provisions that support our our tenants, our lowest income Vermonters. Um, you know, if there's anything else you feel like has really, you know, been on the agenda for a long time and hasn't made it. Um, we are also looking at rental risk mitigation, which we're hearing from behind the scenes is really valuable for, we can't force our landlords to do anything we want them just to take a second chance on, you know, on folks and we're looking at that provision as well. So thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Rachel Seelig. I uh, have two hats at Vermont Legal Aid. I'm both the director of, of our Disability Law Project and our staff attorney for government relations here in the building. Um, I met most of you already, um, but Vermont Legal Aid is the largest civil legal services organization in the state. We receive approximately 20,000 requests for assistance along with our uh, sister organization, Legal Services Vermont, each year, and housing is the largest area where we receive requests for assistance. Um, so I really appreciate the opportunity to come in and talk about what you already have in the omnibus housing bill as well as um, some additional suggestions. So first, uh, we really appreciate the change to Title 24 to enable the development of emergency shelters in our communities. Mm -hmm. uh, the disruption to the lives of Vermonters who become homeless is tremendous, not just for the individual, but for the state. And when that disruption means moving across the state uh, in order to have shelter, it just makes it so much worse. Uh, I can think of, unfortunately, many examples of children that were serving in the Disability Law Project who, although they had the right to continue going to school in their home district, um, the logistics of traveling from Springfield to back to Chittenden County was just such that that was not a right that they were going to be able to use. Mm -hmm. um, so having those shelters in our communities when people lose their housing um, reduces the, the disruption. So really appreciate that change. Um, we do want to ensure that the definition is broad enough to encompass the hotels and motels um, that are continuing to house homeless Vermonters, either through private pay, transitional housing, or the general assistance program. Um, and looking at the primary purpose language, I did have a question for all of you to consider mm -hmm. of whether um, those hotels and motels would cons be considered to have that primary purpose or not. Mm -hmm. And if not, I would want to make sure that that is broad enough to include those facilities. Um, I'm happy to pause there. No, no, I mean, like, it's a rhetorical <laughs> question in a way, but I am like, yes. you know, I don't know if it engenders actual questions. Um, but I, I, I think we'll get to that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> The use of zoning to prohibit emergency shelters is also, in our view, a proxy for unlawful discrimination against individuals who receive public assistance. We actually have a case currently sitting in environmental court where a, a community uh, issued a zoning violation against a hotel um, for housing people who are receiving the traditional housing benefit. Mm -hmm. um, so that's something that is a current and live issue. So mm -hmm. really appreciate the change there. Mm -hmm. um, and I would say that just it dampens the ability to get other hotels and motels to provide this service. Absolutely. So yes. it has a spillover effect. It has a spillover effect. It's not just the harm to that particular facility. It makes others less willing to house our fellow Vermonters. Um, you know, I think it very clearly the primary purpose of what you have here is to reduce barriers to building more housing and especially more affordable housing. And that is absolutely something that we support. Uh, our clients need affordable housing and they need it now. Um, in October, 5,400 families whose income is between 31% and 80% of AMI who do not have subsidized housing lost the help of the VRAP program. 2,700 of those families pay 50% or more of their monthly income in rent. It's not sustainable. Um, and at the end of this fiscal year, the remaining 6,000 households whose incomes are at or below 30% of AMI, which is also known as the federal poverty level, 100% FPL, they will lose their rental assistance. And 
Um, these are also families who do not have subsidized housing, and that rent burden creates tremendous housing instability and puts us at risk of having an even larger homelessness population. Um, as you consider those these changes, as you previewed, uh, we do hope that you will keep the value of inclusivity for families with children, for families that include people with disabilities, for BIPOC families, and for others who face disadvantages in housing at the forefront. It's especially concerning for me as the Disability Law Project Director that the population that remains homeless right now is grossly disproportionate in terms of those with disabilities to the overall population. DCF's report um, is that 37% of adults in emergency shelter have a mental health disability, 22% have substance use disorder, which if it's in treatment is also a covered disability under the ADA and Fair Housing Act, and 34% have some other disability. Yet the most recent US Census shows that only 10.4% of Vermonters under 65 have a disability. So some of the folks that we are struggling the most to find housing for are people with disabilities. And so I would encourage um, being mindful about not just developing more affordable housing, but affordable and accessible housing. Um, and one recommendation I would offer is to be more explicit that the VHIP program uh, can be used to make investments to make units accessible for people with disabilities. I want to move on to the enforcement provisions um, regarding the Human Rights Commission and referrals to the Attorney General's office or state's attorney's offices. As currently drafted, I think our concern here is that it's possible a person would be left with no one to take up their case. Um, because of the referral process and the permissive language that the attorney general or a state's attorney may choose to prosecute that case, a person could end up with no finding from the Human Rights Commission and no prosecutor to prosecute the case. Um, we do think that there needs to be more enforcement of the fair housing laws in the state of Vermont. Um, one path to consider would be to ensure that all landlords get fair housing training so that they understand what their responsibilities are and that we adequately, adequately resource the Human Rights Commission to provide that training, to have enough staff to investigate all housing cases, and to have enough staff to litigate for enforcement within the Human Rights Commission. Um, and right now, we don't see that as, as something that is in existence. So in terms of the bill, I think those are the three primary comments that I would have for you so far. Um, two additional suggestions. <laughs> One is rental subsidies. Um, right now, um, 76,000 households in Vermont are renting households. 38% of those are rent burdened, which means they pay more than 30% of their income on housing. And 19 of the thousand of those 38,000 pay more than 50% of their income <coughs> on rent. Over the course of the pandemic, the VRAP program has helped more than 16,000 families um, cover some, cover all, and now some of their rent. Um, and again, that help will go away at the end of the fiscal year. At the same time, the median rent per month in Vermont has increased $400 a month over the last year. So it's become less and less affordable for these rent burdened families. What we saw though, was that providing rental subsidy through the VRAP program resulted in fewer evictions. 25% fewer evictions were filed during the year where we had that assistance in place. And 13% of those cases that were filed, we were able to settle through rental arrearage assistance. Um, and so we are facing a potential spike in evictions at a time where the courts are also telling us they are overburdened and backlogged. Mm -hmm. um, and so that is of significant concern. We are, I just want to pause because I care a lot about rent to rebate and yes. you know, making sure it's better utilized and there's been a big change in the last year. Are you, do you feel like that's already helping people you in the last month, eviction filings have risen from 25 a week to 40 a week. In the last month. In the last month. So um, I hope it will, um, but I'm not sure that we're seeing that in terms of the court cases that are being filed, okay. unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, 25 a month to 40 a month. Let me, let me just or? double check that. Um, what do I have? 25 per week to 40 per week statewide. Oh, OK. Sorry. 25 to 40? Yeah, over the last month. Okay. So rental assistance we do think is key, and, and mm -hmm. certainly the, the, the rental rebate is a piece of that, but I think fundamentally um, folks cannot afford to pay 50% of their income mm -hmm. in rent. Mm -hmm. um, 
I think the second piece of that is an eviction diversion and rent rescue fund. Um, eviction for non-payment tends to be resolvable with $3,000 or less. Um, and then we can keep those folks stably housed in their home and that's much less expensive than the month after month after month payments uh, to put people in motels. Um, in addition, um, an eviction diversion program can help pre prevent at-risk tendencies from leading to eviction by doing a warm handoff to whether it's uh, a repair fund, a rent arrears fund, existing hot funds, existing subsidy programs, legal counsel, even mediation. Mm -hmm. If the issue is more of a landlord-tenant dispute, then mediation can be a really good solution. And so that would be our second significant suggestion is to, to create um, kind of an ombuds program uh, to, to connect people to the resources that exist. We've talked to the judiciary about this. They're feeling overwhelmed. Um, we've talked with the State Housing Authority about this. They seem open to at least um, housing the rent arrears fund if we could put a million and a half dollars into rent arrears. Okay. Um, and I think we're still exploring some options in terms of who might be open if we could get the funding for um, the eviction diversion staff themselves. Um, so we're working on it. Thank you for working on it. Yes, <laughs> we're not just coming to you with, uh, right. like, we have you no idea. That. We are working on it. I'm interested a little bit in your experience, current experience with the judiciary. Sure. Uh, we, we had a bill in here in the last session mm -hmm. in which we uh, said that we recognize there was the inability of the judiciary to act in a timely fashion regarding some of these environmental court cases mm -hmm. and that we proposed adding an additional judge and funding it as well as adding additional administrative staff and funding it and the judiciary rebelled against that saying we don't need any additional people interestingly enough mm -hmm. and that we don't think the legislature should be interfering in telling us how to run our operation uh, even giving us additional money can you just comment on what your experience is? Is the judiciary capable of handling the, the issues that they have right now? And if not, do you have any sense of why not? Um, is the judiciary capable of handling the issues before them? I mean, yes, they're, they're, they're hearing cases. I was just supervising one of my attorneys yesterday in, in, in a case. So, so they are hearing cases, but I do think the length of time, especially on the criminal side, that trials weren't happening, it, it created a challenge. Um, I, uh, you know, I don't want to speak for them. I never really understand when people say no, we can't benefit from more resources. Um, so I don't know what their logic or thinking there would have been. Um, but you know, if they feel like they have all that they can handle right now, we understand that we we have twice as many calls of legal aid as we had a couple of years ago. We have what we can handle right now. Um, and in order to do more, we ask for more resources. And so, and so that is why we are trying to explore other homes for a housing diversion program, if not the judiciary. We thought it would be a really nice fit with the ARC um, that's getting set up there, the accessing resources in the courts program. Mm -hmm. um, but again, uh, you know, we, we don't want to be deterred by just one person saying we can't handle it. So that's why we're exploring other options. Well, are things like eviction cases, from your experience, being handled in a timely fashion by the judiciary today? Um, yes, uh, I do think they're being, especially the rent escrow uh, piece, those are happening very promptly, um, not always to the benefit of, of our clients, um, mm -hmm. but certainly to the benefit of, of the system overall, I suppose I would say. Um, so yes, I do think that they are they are moving the cases forward. I think. You asked a landlord's representative, they might say, no, they're not moving fast enough. Um, but again, you know, the concept of an eviction diversion program, we keep those cases out of court altogether. Like, we don't have to worry about how fast the judiciary is moving if we can use resources or mediation to resolve the landlord tenant dispute. Well, if a landlord comes uh, and wants to evict uh, a tenant who's a, a tenant that's one of your clients, mm -hmm. how long does the process take at, on average? based on your experience currently? You know, the numbers are really skewed right now because of the moratorium. So I would have to go back and look at like what those numbers have been since the moratorium came to an end. Mm -hmm. And I don't have those off the top of my head, but I'm happy to get them for you. Thank you. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. You've learned from the best to say. That's <laughs> right. <laughs> yes, well trained. <laughs> Any, Any other questions I can answer? That is really helpful. Okay. Thank you. Well, I think, I mean, we've said this to a few different witnesses, but 
would love to stay in touch with you. And oh, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And don't go yeah. away. I mean, go away. I'm around the building yeah. a lot, and I can also yeah. bring some of our folks who do the housing work day in, day out right. to talk to you more um, and get into even more of the weeds. Sounds so. good. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm interested a little bit in your comments regarding uh, housing homeless people in hotels mm -hmm. and hotels uh, turning them away. And, and I think you said, particularly in cases of people who had. Uh, disabilities of one kind or another, of including substance abuse disorder and mental illness. Oh, so to be clear, those are populations who are currently being housed, housed in the motel, the percent of people in motels yeah. with those disabilities. Yes. So yeah. not that they're being turned around. They are, that's the number that are currently being housed in yeah. motels. No, you, What's hard is to find them housing outs in, in like permanent support. That's what I'm trying to understand was, yeah. is there a case in which people that you're trying to house in motels are either not being admitted or being kicked out. And the, the, the issues are those two forms of disability. Um, I have, oh, sorry. <laughs> no, I've been working with a young woman who I've known for 20 years. To the best of my knowledge, she has no, she has some, she has some mental health issues, but nothing particularly severe. Um, as best of my knowledge, she has no addiction issues. The motel told her that they had pictures of her dealing drugs in the parking lot. They would not show her the film, um, and they did not evict the other person she was accused of having this transaction with. But she was out. The social worker that was working with her said, oh, they're doing that a lot because they get more money from the state when they take somebody in. And she and her two severely high needs children were uh, living in their car for several weeks until they found a domestic violence place. And she started here in Barrie mm -hmm. with a sexual assault against one of the children case person was in a nursing home, it got delayed, and it's now been dismissed without prejudice. Okay. So it, it's, it is happening. Well, what I'm trying to understand is uh, from the, the debate between the two parties of how the issue is defined. For example, you have a motel that says, I have a person who's using illegal drugs on the property and is purchasing and selling illegal drugs, one. Two, uh, I have a person who has a mental illness that is manifesting themselves, itself in d either disruptive behavior or harassing behavior or noisy behavior and so on. Where does legal aid stand in terms of dealing with a case like that if that person is one of your clients? Is that behavior uh, appropriate? Is it prohibited? Is, how, how, how do you deal with that? So when someone is a current user of illegal drugs, they're not covered as a person with a disability under the Fair Housing Act. Okay. If they're in treatment, they are. Um, but what if they're in treatment and they're currently using? That is an unsettled area of law. <laughs> <laughs> At least that's a clear <laughs> answer. We're going to get a simple that's answer. That's a very unsettling answer. <laughs> Um, so I think our position would be, what are the reasonable accommodations that we can put in place so that a person can remain housed um, and, and have their disability-related needs adequately met? And I think the reality is, and we, no one will disagree about this, hotels are not the ideal place for anyone to be living. It is harm mitigation, <coughs> right? Um, but until we you know, have the housing available and the supports available yeah. um, for people to move out of the motels, we have to make them work as well as we can. Um, and so you know, f you know, it's always individualized, right? Like I can't tell you like, this is the blanket solution, right? Um, I worked with a client a number of years ago with autism who has very loud vocal stims. The solution there was to soundproof the apartment so that they weren't bothering the neighbors, right? Um, so, you know, there are, it's always very individualized. What is the specific behavior here that um, is because of the disability? And how can this person be reasonably accommodated to maintain equal access and enjoyment of the housing that's being provided? And then in a situation like that, who's responsible for paying for that? It depends. Um, when, <laughs> it depends. I mean, that's the reality. 
So under the Fair Housing Act, it's not the responsibility of a landlord to pay for reasonable modifications. Unless someone is receiving a subsidy like Section 8, then it's still not the landlord, but the landlord and the Section 8 provider would work on you know, funding that physical modification to a space. Um, otherwise, it can be on, on the tenant themselves um, to pay for a physical modification if there's no federal funds involved. And I think you have a second one. Yes. yes. <laughs> so, was it, was it um, but I would be very change. happy to come back. I'd also be very happy to bring our, our housing discrimination law project staff in to talk more about, about right. fair housing. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Hi, Kathy. Rachel, I apologize for missing your testimony. It's I'm, lovely to see you. We so haven't heard you. about your housing dilemmas for so long in this committee. Yes. It is wonderful. My <laughs> housing dilemma personally is finally resolved. I found a house. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. yes. Which, which is great. Your father is. We're in a committee that's like one at a time. We'll house that's right. We'll find <laughs> Thanks so much. Yes, good morning. Hi, some of you know me. I'm Kathy Beyer, and I'm Senior Vice President for um, Real Estate Development at Evernorth. And Yay. you may remember um, we used to be called Housing Vermont, but in 2020, in the midst of the pandemic, we merged with a sister nonprofit based out of Portland, Maine. And my company now works in the three northern New England states. And um, collectively, over 30 years of experience, we've raised over a billion dollars of equity for affordable housing. And we have to add the recipient of a major award that many of us were lucky enough to witness <laughs> thank earlier you. this fall. Uh, thank you. You no. in particular. So we oh, love to talk about the whole bill. And one subject we, we just started to touch on is, you know, energy yep. and how that's coming into play with, sure. you know, we want to articulate this bill as a housing bill, but also a housing bill that fits within our environmental crisis. That's well. great. So, yeah. Um, so as a nonprofit real estate developer, um, uh, my work specifically in Evernorth is, is um, focused in Vermont and you know we work with partners like Champlain Housing Trust, Wyndham and Windsor Housing Trust and um, Downstreet in Central Vermont. And I just want to state that a decent affordable home is, is as essential as having clean air to breathe. And we know this, right? A secure home is what you need to have a good life. It's what you need in order to have physical and mental well-being. So just as government has a role in ensuring that we have clean air to breathe, government has a role in ensuring we have decent and affordable homes. And that is why this housing bill, at this point in time, is essential. I'd like to talk about three aspects um, of the bill today. Density um, for land on town, water, and sewer. Um, parking and a section that's not in the committee bill related to energy codes. So first, land that is connected to town, water, and sewer should be considered a precious resource to the community. Just as we conserve our farmland, we should look at our, t our land that's connected to town, water, and sewer because it is a finite resource yeah. and it is the only way we're going to build our way out of this housing crisis. The committee bill does that by recognizing that if you're in a zoning district with um, municipal water and sewer, if you can build a single family home, you can build a fourplex. And you uh, also directs the town to um, have a density of at least five units per acre. Honestly, if I have one particular bill, it might be to even look at increasing that density. Um, but I know some folks are gonna be offended by this requirement. Why should the state tell towns what to do? The flip side to this question is, why do we continue to consume so much of our land and infrastructure for single family homes to the exclusion of housing with density? We have been doing this for decades and if you've read that book on the bookshelf there, The Color of Law, you will be astounded by the impact and the prevalence of single family zoning across the country. And you know, we can look at ourselves, like many of our children and grandchildren are not gonna be able to afford that lovely single family home on a fifth of an acre, but they might be happy with a uh, half of a duplex. I can give you a real world example of how hard it is to find land on um, town water and sewer. In West Brattleboro, Melrose Terrace, 80 units of public housing that was built in the 50s, it was built in not only the 100 year floodplain, it was built in the floodway. It had been flooded many times and in tropical storm, Irene was severely flooded. We had to move, we had to build new housing and get those 
uh, households, many of whom were disabled, you know, all seniors out of there. We're fortunate, we found a parcel near the Brattleboro High School, built 55 beautiful new um, apartments called Red Clover Commons, but we still had about 20 households left in what was not a safe place for them to be. It took us three years to find land that was zoned for multifamily housing on town water and sewer. And do you know where we eventually found it? On the same parcel where we built those 55 units. So we took a density, we were at a density of 20 units per acre. We went to 26 units per acre and have a, a beautiful community. But if that density wasn't allowed, we wouldn't have been able to do that. I'm not suggesting that kind of density needs to be mandated. But what I'm pointing out is, and I, and I, because I've been doing this a long time and I work across the state, I can tell you in every community how hard it is to find land on town water and sewer. So, can I just? I don't know if you're going to go to parking. No, but go ahead. I, I was not just, quite yet. I feel like I've heard Evan North talk a lot about Act 250, um, and I'm surprised. It's is it not going to come up in your thoughts? I wasn't going to mention it today. Okay. Mm -hmm. We, I can come back sometime, or we'll see if we have time today. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I honestly, I think the most important part the portion of this bill is density. Yeah. So we have a housing crisis. We are not going to get out of this housing crisis by building a single family home after a single family. Mm -hmm. And that's what this um, very significant portion of this bill does. And we are also making, it appears, significant investments in, in, um, uh, water and sewer infrastructure through directing federal right. dollars to the town. So like, this is exactly, exactly <laughs> when we should be asking this question. If you are going to mm -hmm. improve your water or sewer um, infrastructure in the town, what's your density? So it's a, it's actually fortuitous that this yeah. came up. No, it's amazing. The They're all aligned at the same moment. Yeah. And the federal money, everything is. Yeah. So next I was going to talk about parking. Um, and. For years, it was standard to pick up a zoning ordinance. Two spaces per dwelling unit was very standard. And um, you would think, well, why do I care as an affordable housing developer? It's, it, it, honestly, it's not the cost of building the parking. It's that um, the requirement to have two spaces per dwelling unit often means we can build less housing. Um, you all. Um, state funders uh, and we want to build in our downtowns our village centers these tight infill sites and if you have to put two spaces per unit on those sites it just means you're going to build less housing and I have a real world example in Stowe not to pick on Stowe but it's very expensive to <laughs> could be a number of our communities it's, um, we had uh, the opportunity to um, uh, create 14 affordable um, apartments in Stowe, that was 2020, 2021. And um, in doing so, there was an existing building with three apartments easily converted to four apartments. It wouldn't cost much money. We actually, would have, the building would have laid out better. We had no more room in the parking lot to add two more spaces, so we couldn't. There was no waiver provision. And it may seem silly, like one more apartment, but believe me, one more apartment in Stowe. Oh, would have been right. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I do know from talking with property management that the parking lot's never full. In fact, yeah. So um, the third thing I was going to talk about is um, something that's not in this bill, but is in the House bill, um, which has to relate to energy code. And. The House bill acknowledges that many towns want to do more for climate change by um, adopting more aggressive energy codes through their zoning ordinance. And what the House bill does is says, you can do that, you can adopt the state stretch energy code. And that uh, one thing that does, that means we won't have a patchwork among towns. You know, I go to the city of Montpelier and they have this energy code, and then I go to Waterbury and they have this energy code. So um, from a builder's perspective, it would be helpful to know this consistency. But more importantly, it means that equity is also part of the consideration. So the, the state's um, 2022 Comprehensive Energy Plan actually has a very good section on energy justice. And one of the things it calls out is that regional planning commissions and towns through their energy committees need to do an analysis of the potential equity impacts of policies they adopt. 
at the state level, the Public Service Department has to update the energy code every three years. I've been involved in that process several times. And in that update, um, the process includes a discussion of equity and consumer economics on the proposed code. So if towns are going to go beyond the stretch code, the question is, can they also do this equity analysis? And I just think it's doubtful, right? Town by town, it's, um, it would be a, a heavy lift. So that's what the section of the House bill does. It says you can adopt the stretch code. The stretch code is um, uh, in accordance with what the Public Service Department is mandated to do, that by um, 2030, all of our new construction will be net zero. So it's on a path to getting there. It's now 2023. 2030 is not that far away. Um, so I'd encourage you to look at that section of the bill. There, I have also, um, and I wasn't as prepared to talk about this today, but I um, have been working with what we're calling the Energy Justice and Housing Working Group. And um, I actually will send you, we just are ready to release what we're calling our charge paper. And there, um, I would say it's, it, and actually the state's comprehensive energy plan um, calls us out that the state energy policies and incentives and benefits have not been equitably, equitably distributed right. across the state and among mm -hmm. and um, and and we know that the energy burden on lower income Vermonters is three times that of the um, upper income level. And so, it it is. I, I welcome that discussion. I wasn't as prepared to talk about it today, but um, it needs to be talked about, particularly in this time of trying to address climate change. Right, so just, I'm actually just getting confused because I, I'd be curious what's in the equity analysis and who wrote it and you know what it's driving toward. I yep. mean, right, because I think if, if you talk about you know environmental justice, what I think you're getting at is eventually creating less volatile <coughs> energy costs for people, requiring less of their income to go to the cost of energy. Mm -hmm. Um, and subsidizing their path to get there. What I'm struggling to hear from like just adopting a, a more streamlined energy code is how that happens. Yep. No, it's a good question. Um, so I think the difficult part of the um, energy equity discussion in housing is that our lowest income households, our lowest income households are renters. Mm -hmm. They uh, may be living in apartments where the, we call the split incentive, the landlord doesn't pay for the heat. Mm -hmm. No incentive for the landlord to do the upgrades. Yeah, that's an unfortunate situation. Um, look, uh, also low, they may be low income homeowners and tend to live in older homes that have a, a lot more needs. How do you, the, the challenge is how do you make sure our lower income households are first in line for this, this decarbonization that we need mm -hmm. to go through? And that's challenging because it's going to cost more money. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And our energy policy, and you know, I've been working with Peter Walk on this, and our energy, particularly our energy incentives, our energy efficient efforts have all been focused, have all been for since the start of Efficiency Vermont on basically the lowest hanging fruit. Mm -hmm. Let's go after, I mean, it makes sense, right? You know, if I spend, I'm like, it's easiest, the it's easiest. Middle income. The All easiest, afford right. And you know. we need to flip that on its head. Mm -hmm. We need to say, and you know, it was done for good reasons, but I think now we need to say, no, nope, it's not gonna be the lowest cost. We're not gonna go after the lowest cost. We're gonna prioritize the, the, hard, hard, the, the hardest, the lowest yeah. income. And we, we have not, right now for, um, well, not this year, but in past years, for um, the affordable housing that we build, we're signing up for um, um, restricted rents, got the same incentive from Efficiency Vermont as a market rate developer. It was $2,700 a unit if you met high, you know, if you met this checklist of energy efficiency, it was the same for uh, affordable housing as it was for market rate housing. And we did that for 20 years mm -hmm. or more. So it's a good time to start having that. I mean, and I know Efficiency Vermont right. is, very, is having this conversation. Yeah. 
I mean, that's, yeah, so I don't know if we're talking about the same goal with arriving at it in different ways, but, you know, I personally would be really interested in looking at reducing, uh, you know, providing Act 250 exemptions or reducing barriers to development, reducing duplicative permitting, and, and really incentivizing or fast tracking if you are doing a net zero project or a no fossil fuel project or meeting an efficiency Vermont standards. You know, I mean, this is actually the time, I think, to, to push that with all the incentives coming from the federal government. And we, I, I'm starting to talk to developers who are essentially doing some type of net zero projects, um, like in South Burlington, and have no additional benefit from the state for, for doing that. So I guess I'm trying to think of creative ways to actually get new housing on the market mm -hmm. that, that doesn't require those huge, you know, doesn't require all these retrofits and start off with renters who have to pay high energy bills. Um, and I'm just not hearing from just leaving the energy code where it is, mm -hmm. how, we, how we help renters get there. For new construction or for um existing either way like what about leaving the energy code at stretch helps renters that doesn't help renters in existing housing and i would actually okay. be maybe it's controversial but i would say don't focus on our new construction i mean we the private developers we are building really highly energy efficient yes. buildings that are near net zero mm -hmm. and we're doing it today mm -hmm. it's the existing housing yeah. The, the equity of the loan come out, that's where our loan come house are mm -hmm. renting, are owning. That's the most difficult to get at. But in terms of, I mean, all you got to do is drive around any town and look at that old building. It's like heating the outdoors, right? Mm -hmm. Those are the hardest to get to. But that, to me, is where the equity lies. It's like, no, we're not going to focus on new construction. New construction is so close to getting there. Yeah. And in... Um, many communities already electrified or decarbonized, but I got to take this. I mean, we have within our own portfolio um, multifamily rental housing that we we purchased in like the you know 80s or 90s that was already 30 years old, mm -hmm. and it's it's needs more. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, I am, <coughs> so but just help help me understand how how not letting communities depart upward in their energy code help builds equity or helps lower income people with their energy bills? Um, I guess I was trying to say the reverse, that um, rather than having town by town adopt a different energy code, mm -hmm. and again, that's mostly focused on new construction, mm -hmm. um, that let's use the state code where there has at least been um, there, there, there is, I guess I've been involved in the process, mm -hmm. there is an analysis of what, what is the impact for this new construction and adopting this energy code, what is going to be the burden, what is going to be the energy burden as an outcome of it. So I think the energy code is, is about new construction. Um, okay. And um, like I said, I, I, I don't, from both a climate change perspective, and an equity perspective, I think new construction is not where our focus needs okay. to be. I, we can talk offline, but I, 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 I think I'm misunderstanding how that provision that we've left out of the bill yeah. achieves greater equity and helps people with their energy bills. Yeah. And it, you think it does? You think that piece of the bill achieves greater equity and helps people with their energy bills? Um, If we let towns um, adopt their energy code based on what their energy committee recommends, right? That's what happens. Mm -hmm. And I'm not confident an analysis of equity will be done because it's diff it's a difficult analysis. You have to make assumptions about what's the cost of you know going from an, a, 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 this much in insulation to this much mm -hmm. insulation. So it's it's a complicated thing to assess. Right. And it is assessed on the state level. Mm -hmm. you know, maybe towns can do it. But. Yeah, well, I don't hear you. I, I, what I hear you saying is consistent energy codes is, is, is much more helpful. So if, if, if we allow every town, if we allow everybody to uh, go, 
use adopt the stretch codes, that is a consistent yeah. measure that will be much easier uh, as we as we go forward, both yes. for renovations and for new construction. Mm -hmm. So if you could send the equity analysis of the stretch code, yeah, that, that would, would be, be helpful. That would be I great. Don't know if, I don't, I don't, I haven't seen the state it may, equity analysis. All of your like, concerns may be embedded in that. Right. And I, I thought that bill didn't allow a town to depart upward in making, in increasing efficiency. It lets them go to the stretch code. It, it says you go to the stretch code. Yeah. It says you go to the stretch, and it but it, it keeps them, it, it limits them from going beyond the stretch code. Yeah. That's what it does, yeah. right? It yeah. doesn't, yeah. they can depart downward somewhere in between yeah. the energy code and the stretch code. Honestly, um, as I started out with my statements, it's not the most important part of the bill. The most okay. important bill is the density yes. provision. No, no, we're clear. <laughs> density, parking. I mean, we have our colleagues asking us to say, can you say no new fossil fuel hookups? You know, right? So I'm just, confused as to where this would fit in uh, in that conversation but feel free to share other yeah yeah thank you yeah thank you thanks happy friday thanks, thanks. Rachel. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.